best favorite here at Kai. So please give Floyd a round of applause. And so Games Lab. We are lab, hence we are wearing lab coats. Um, with my co-authors, we are presenting Experiencing the Body as Clay. Because in the Exertion Games Lab, we work with the realization that we used to play with digital content. And now, thanks to sensor advances, we are playing with the digital using our bodies. But what we rather want is experiencing our bodies as digital play. And therefore, in this talk, I give you like two perspectives on the human body as a way to make this vision a reality. But the body is an interesting thing. On the one hand, we have a body, and then on the other hand, we are a body. This is pretty much all this talk is about. Um, and we're also not the first people to realize that. Merleau-Ponty, uh, for example, um, talked a lot about this. I'm never quite sure whether he liked the body because he, he was a very heavy smoker, apparently. Um, but what we are giving you here now is two perspectives on the human body. So you see the body from one perspective and then again from another perspective. But it's the same human body. And uh, one perspective is that material perspective. So this is very much looking at it as an object, the fleshy bit of it. And the other perspective is that lived perspective. And this is where um, uh, Kim meets Merleau Ponty, because she's really good at looking at the material perspective, right? Because for centuries we've been looking at mirrors. So here, here's my mirror, and you look at it now from the material perspective, right? So that's you right here. But Kim now highlights that um, since we've got technology, we actually look at ourselves in the mirror for digital means, right? We use our phone to look at ourselves in the mirror from the material perspective. And that's what we can do into the filters, Photoshop, and so forth, and it changes our material perspective. And the problem with that is that we forget the other perspective. And that's why we've got all these problems with our bodies, with how we see it um, turns into physical health problems, mental health problems, our body image, all that because we only look at one perspective on the human body when we design these experiences. Uh, so this, this, this whole talk is about making the argument that we always need to look at both perspectives, in particular if we want to design something playful. So um, there's these two perspectives. And the first one is, as I just demonstrated, that seeing the body in a mirror as an object, as an object amongst other objects. So for your phone, the, the body is as good as the chair, as was Kim Kardashian's bathroom back wall there. They were all objects. But it's important to now also look at how it is experienced by the person as him or herself. So Kim would say, like, how do I feel about my body in that picture? And that's the second perspective. And interesting enough, um, in English we use the same word for these two perspectives. But in other languages, uh, other languages such as German, there's actually two words for that. And the word for this perspective in German is Körper. And um, I give you here now a free language lesson. In German, Körper, if you can all repeat that word for me on 3, 2, 1. 3, Körper. 2, 1. Körper. Beautiful. So that's your first word that you learned today. Um, it comes from, it's got the same origin, um, uh, corpus, the Latin um, origin, might remind you of corpse, right? So this is a perspective on, you can also use that word to describe a dead body. It's a perspective from just the fleshy bit, whether it's alive or not. The other word we're learning today is called Leib. So on three, two, one, Leib. Three, two, one. Leib. Beautiful. So uh, this is the other German word, and that, not surprisingly, has the same origin as the English word life. So this is very much concerned with the living body. And that's important because then you can see how um, every life has to have a körper, but not every körper has to have a life. Right? So for example, this, this table here that has a 
has a curve, but not a line. Um, humans have a light and a curve. Animals have a light and a curve. Robots only have a curve. So far. Good point, yeah. Come to that. <laughs> Um, and knowing these two words, what you just learned, is very important because we know, for, um, we know that knowing different words help you see things differently and also experience things differently. For example, there are studies in Polynesian culture where people who live near water, where, there's a lot of, um, where, you know, where it's important for them to know about water, um, and they encounter a lot of different varieties of blue. Turns out they actually have more words for different shades of blue than, let's say, in most Western cultures. And that allows them actually to perceive different light frequencies so they can see different blue, blue colors than most of us can. And that's, why they, and that's because and why they have different words for that. So I would argue that uh, if you have now, for example, more words for these different colors than the person sitting next to you, you are actually able to see different colors and differentiate between them. Like I, I in particular, always find these two colors really hard to differentiate. If you've got words for that, you actually see these, that these two colors are very different, like especially when you block out all the other ones. Right, so it's important to have these words. Because if you have now the kerpa and the lie as two new words in your vocabulary, I would argue it makes you a better designer if you design for the human body. You might even go that far saying that if you, um, and if, if, you, if you know the German language, it makes you a better designer. But I leave that for future. <laughs> um, so in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in this talk, we now argue that we need to design for the uh, interplay between Kerpa and Leib. We can't just design for one of them. Because if you do that, you end up with this. This is dwarf tossing, which is a cultural phenomenon that arrived in around the 90s. And this is a picture from the Wolf of Wall Street, which um, apparently really happened in their offices, not just in the pubs. And dwarf tossing works like this. So you hire people affected by dwarfism, and then you um, throw them as far as you can, and the winner is who throws them the furthest. And there was a lot of debate about that when it came around, right? And now imagine just in, in your head, uh, like what's your argument against this type of play? Let's say you're against it. I hope you do. Um, just think about how would you argue against it, right? Because here, what happened was that the people affected by dwarfism actually were often very much for it because, you know, they said from a Kerpa perspective, I'm totally fine. I'm wearing a helmet, I'm wearing a, uh, a padded jacket, there's a mattress I'm going to be thrown onto. Um, actually, there's no physical risk. And also, I actually can feed myself because this is one of the few jobs I can get. But then what happened is lawmakers came in and they said, now we can't allow this practice. And they were wondering, like, how do we argue for that? And they took a live perspective and said, we can't allow this for reasons of dignity. Right? So they used dignity as a live perspective to argue why this is really, really bad forms of play. So here's a very good example of why you have to always take these two perspectives, in particular when you design play and the human body. So what I'm going to show you now is a couple of case studies that illustrate how you can design different types of play experiences with that interplay between Körper and Leib, Leib and Körper. The first one I want to show you is Balance Ninja. And in that little video I'm going to show you next, I want to just um, encourage you to take a focus on A, the Körper perspective, how we use sensors to augment the, um, uh, the body, to sense when a person is swaying on a little balance board, and then take the light perspective to use that to facilitate uh, a thrilling vertigo experience. Have a look at the little video. Vertigo has been described in game design as games that attempt to momentarily destroy the stability of perception and inflict a kind of voluptuous panic, or pleasurable panic, upon an otherwise lucid mind. So, for example, vertigo games could include simply spinning in circles, skiing, racing fast cars, and even rock climbing. With our work, we investigate how we can design digital vertigo games by taking advantage of the digital technology now available to us. To investigate this, we built Balance Ninja. Balance Ninja is a two-player balance game where players directly affect the balance of their opposing player. 
Firstly, players stand on a balance board and move their upper body to the left and to the right, and we measure this lean with a mobile device. Secondly, through using a technology called Galvanic Vestibular Stimulation, or GVS for short, the game directly affects a player's sense of balance. With GVS, a small current of around 1.5 milliamps is applied to electrodes attached behind players' ears. The resultant effect is that the player's sense of balance is affected in the direction of the positive electrode, causing them to lean in that direction. So basically, when one person leans to the right, the GVS of the opposing player triggers in that same direction, which makes the other player lean and attempt to compensate. The object and challenge of Balance Ninja is to cause the opposing player to touch their ball to the floor whilst trying to remain balanced themselves. So, uh, you can see the, uh, the rest of the video online. Uh, I'm just going to skip here straight to the discussion about the körper and the light in terms of Balance Ninja. But before I do that, I want to highlight two aspects of that, and that's perceptions and sensations. Perceptions um, is very easy, um, you know, you all know that. Um, if you, for example, perceive the yellowness of this tennis ball, right, you all know how it works. There is light uh, reflected on the uh, yellow of the ball, and then it hits your eye, right? And the interesting thing here is if you take the Kerber perspective, um, you need to realize, or you, you should realize, that the yellowness of the ball is actually external to your body, right? It is not reflect. It is, it is the yellow is not in your eyeball. It's ex, it's external to the body. Um, nothing new. You know this because we, as interaction designers, have done a lot of stuff with uh, vision and sound. On the other hand, there are sensations, right? And they very much lend themselves to the light perspective because they are localized. For example, um, there's touch, there's the vestibular sense, which is the sense of balance that you just saw. Proprioception is about the limbs in relationship to, other, to your other limbs. And the kinesthetic sense is a sense of movement. And they are all allowing us to develop this localized sensation. So if I have your hand touching my hand, for example, I can feel in my hand that it is being touched. Right? It's not like in, with the eye example. I can feel in my hand that it is being touched. Um, it allows me to experience my body as mine. <coughs> Again, you don't have that in vision and sound. And that is important because we can now understand Balance Ninja from these two perspectives. Because on the one hand, your vision told you that you are stable, because you, know, you see the walls around you. But then your vestibular sense tells you that, oh, you are actually swaying to that direction. And that creates this interesting conflict that can be really a really powerful tool for game designers, creating this conflict between the körper and the light. And that is important because when we look at the user experience, there's again two aspects I want to um, talk about. These are emotions and feelings. I again go a little bit back to theory, um, pointing to William James, who was the first one to uh, articulate that. Um, uh, he talked about a bear, right? And uh, here you can go to the national park and encounter a, a grizzly bear at any time. And he basically said, this is what happens. Um, oh, sorry, before, before he came around, everybody thought what's happened is, you know, you experience fear, and therefore your heart rate goes up, and you get sweaty palms and all that. He was arguing, and turns out he was right, and it's actually the other way around. First thing is that your heart rate goes up. Your hands get sweaty. So it's this, um, this, 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 um, uh, this physiological response that you can't control. And, because, and once your brain realizes that, then you experience fear. So this is the other way around. And that's important to understand because then you can see in Balance Ninja that your body responds with vertigo, but because it's in a playful, safe context, you actually experience like playful thrill. So again, it's a way of looking at the körper and the life to understand what was going on. I'll show you another example next. Um, this is Ava the e-bike. Very different example, but again, these two words will help you körper and life. With um, Ava, we were interested in um, the joy that comes from riding a bicycle. But there's a huge surge in e-bikes, right? And we wanted to bring the joy of riding a bike into the 21st century. With that, because you're really afraid that e-bikes turn into these autonomous vehicles that just take you from A to B. We really wanted to support the joy of riding. So we created an augmented e-bike. And again, look at how we use the körper perspective to augment um, the, um, the exertion activity with sensors. And then we try to design for the light perspective. 
the joy of riding a bike. E-bikes offer physical activity and well-being benefits, yet not a lot of exploration has occurred into human e-bike interaction within HCI. I ride my e-bike for pleasure, to the park, shops and just for fun. However, most e-bike functionality is designed for commuting rather than to support playful experiences. We present Ava the e-bike. Eva focuses on supporting and maintaining engagement with e-bike riding and reducing interaction obstacles for the rider. Following an experienced design approach, we created the following e-bike functionality extensions through an iterative approach. We use inherent cycling body movement to playfully interface with the Evex engine as a way to fuse the rider's body to Eva's. This is body inclining acceleration. We added four different sound modes, three sounds and a silent mode, that the rider can explore. So when accelerating, the sound echoes the rider's interaction, adding to the sense of speed and playfulness. So here again, we look at the perception and the sensation. So the perception is one of acceleration, right? So when you pedal and then lean forward like you do in order to put more effort in, the engine accelerates. And that gives you like this kinesthetic sensation of movement. But then we also need to look at the emotion because here it's a sense of adrenaline our participants said, which was then further amplified by the playful sound because that they said gave them a feeling of being a superhero. They said, I felt like a superhero on the bike when I leaned forward there was a superhero sound rather than the bike moving me from A to B. They, their body became the, the hero. Uh, so the last example I want to show you is Lifetree, which is a um, system we developed to help you practice good breathing technique. And for that we looked again at the Kerpa and used the head mounted display to block out any distractions, but then looked at the live experience, how we actually feel about that. Regular breathing exercises can be a beneficial part of leading a healthy life. Digital games may have the potential to help practice breathing exercises in an immersive and engaging way. However, designing breathing exercise games is not well understood. In order to understand this, we designed Lifetree, a virtual reality breathing exercise game that helps players practice per-slip breathing, or PLB, in an immersive, reflective and engaging way. We use a head-mounted display along with a headset specifically built to measure the exhale while practicing PLB. Players understand how to breathe by taking cue of a rhythmic breathing sound in the background. Users get the feedback from the leaves being blown towards the tree on exhalation. As a reflection of their lungs expanding and contracting, the trunk of the tree expands and contracts on inhalation and exhalation. The goal of the game is to practice PLB rhythmically for two and a half minutes to keep the game in focus and fill colour into the lifeless tree and make it full of life. Designing Life Tree helped us gain a few insights into the design of breathing exercise games. Every time that I have meditated, I feel like I get distracted and you know, start thinking of something and having that visual reinforcement almost gives you like a way to be on track. This is live tree, and again, we can look at the two words curb and light to understand how the VR headset blocked out all visual distractions. Right? It wasn't so much about immersing, but rather blocking out distractions. Because that allowed you to focus inwards, in particular your proprioception of your um, stomach and your lungs moving in and out. In terms of emotions and feeling, it facilitated a reduced heart rate. And the result of that reduced heart rate, we would argue, is calmness. So with these three systems, Balance Ninja, Ava, the e-bike, we developed a bunch of design strategies for the limits of the Kerpa, 
uh, the interplay and the shift in focus. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the very first one, and then I'll finish up. Um, the first one is about using the limits of the Kerpa as facilitator for intriguing life experiences. And that is about, you, you, um, this particular, um, if you look at Balance Ninja here, one of the limitations of your life is that you can never actually completely stand still. Your body always gets tired in one leg or the other, so you always sway a little bit. You constantly control for that. And that's one limitation that the Kerpa has. And if you then look at Balanced Ninja, you can use that to facilitate that uh, playful, thrill, live experience. So to sum up, we argue that we come from playing with digital to using the digital, uh, to play with digital using our bodies, what we rather want is experiencing our bodies as digital play. And for that, we gave you now two new words, Körper and Leib, if you all repeat Körper and Leib on three, two, one. Körper, Leib. Beautiful, thank you. Um, there's two aspects to it, perception and sensation, as well as emotion and feeling. And with that, you are able to experience your body as play, we argue. My name is Floyd Müller from the Ecclesian Lab. Thank you very much.